Right, we're all set. Very good. Thanks for working it out, and uh, we'll get going here. Tonight's guest presentation, I would like to uh, reintroduce to you, because many of you know our presenter tonight. He is the President Emeritus of Madison Astronomical Society. He's also a great friend of the club, and a, we've had so many great presentations here from John. And if you enjoy the presentations that we have from uh, amateur and professional astronomers, um, John puts in an awful lot of work and has an awful lot of great contacts. Um, give John, extend John your thanks for all the great speakers he brings to us, including himself tonight. Um, and and uh, uh, his tonight's presentation is titled Protecting the Night, Light Pollution Reduction in Madison. And he's been putting an awful lot of work in this topic and we're looking forward to your update. Thank you so much for being here, John. Thanks, Lawrence. So, so the guys just informed me that there was a problem with the YouTube feed. Something seems to be conflicting with my laptop, so this is not going out over the stream. So we'll try to go back and make that available later. But I'm going to talk today about uh, the whole issue of light pollution in Madison. And uh, shout out to Ben, because as, as Ben mentioned a few minutes ago, he did all of the legwork for communicating with the various city governments around us and got all of those dark sky proclamations uh, written and accepted by the various government agencies. And so next week is Dark Sky Week, International Dark Sky Week, and it's being recognized here. When I think the drift of your question was, is anybody going to say, like, let's turn the lights out for an hour? Let's turn the lights out for a minute. You know, I don't think anything like that is happening, but maybe next year we can get a countywide shut off the lights at 9 o'clock on Monday night or something like that. So uh, this, this is going to be an international dark sky week that actually does get some attention and maybe helps some other things to get some traction, which we're going to talk about next. Um, I'm going to show you a variety of pictures tonight of the Madison area. This is one that I took when Comet Neowise was uh, prominent. And this was shot from uh, the boat landing at Olin Park, uh, right across at the Isthmus. So about the worst light pollution situation you could possibly ask for to try to catch a faint comet, but I was able to get it. And in the process, capturing there the unedited Capitol building with about a one second exposure, probably the single most uh, prominent offender when it comes to wasted light in the city of Madison is the myriad uh, spotlights that are basically shining up into the sky so that about 5% of that light can fall on the dome of the Capitol. Um, we'll talk about a lot of examples of good and bad when it comes to light pollution around the Madison area. Um, the title of the talk is, Could Madison, Wisconsin Be a Dark Sky Community? And I am John Rommel. So, I'm going to show you a variety of pictures, uh, just you know, five or six of them uh, as we go through tonight. This building is uh, one of the good examples, I think. This is Hilldale Mall, and the building there is the um, Sundance AMC Theater building. Now, this is shot from behind, from the west, looking toward the mall, toward the east. And um, that lighting, uh, the, the concealed lighting up here, shining down toward the sidewalk, that is one example of really, really good lighting design. Um, as you can see on, this is the west side of the building. Those lights provide plenty of illumination for that sidewalk. So any pedestrian action that happens there, those people have plenty of light. On the other uh, face, you've got, these, um, you've got these street lights partially shielded, they're not bad. And then of course you've got the parking lot lights too. So you've got a lot of light on that side, a little bit of light clutter going on. But whoever designed that external lighting for the AMC theater building in uh, Hilldale Mall, that's a pretty good example of the kind of lighting that we want to reward, we want to encourage. We want to reach out to whoever, the building facilities manager, the designer, the architect, and, and say, you know, thank you for thinking of that. That's, that's not bad stuff. Being a good educator, here are tonight's objectives. This is what I want to cover tonight. We're going to talk about light pollution in general. So if you've never really had an introduction to what light pollution is, 
I'm going to try to provide that in about the first you know, 10 or 15 slides. We're going to talk about Madison, Wisconsin specifically. How is Madison doing when it comes to smart lighting, um, lighting that saves energy, lighting that protects the night sky? We're going to talk about the International Dark Sky Association's Dark Sky Community Program because that just became relevant to Madison in the last year. All of a sudden, unexpectedly, that became relevant to Madison. And then we're going to ask the question and end with that, could Madison be an international dark sky community? So that's where we'll come back to. Another one of those examples of lighting near Madison. This is a building that caught my attention here on the west side. I live on the west side, so all of my pictures are from the west side, so I apologize to the downtowners and the east siders. This is the CUNA Mutual Campus. They just demolished that round building, that, that kind of landmark round building that was there for all of those years. And they just finished this construction in about the last year and a half. And it's got that thing on the south exposure. Um, I did contact somebody from CUNA, a great guy who works for facilities management, and he talked to me. That's their auditorium or that's the cantilever portion of the auditorium that kind of projects out onto Mineral Point Road. And of course, I shot a picture of it at night because it's lit very inventively. Uh, it's obviously uh, a great design element of the building. Uh, it's also pretty bright. It's not terrible, but it's, it's striking. Um, he gave me the details of how it's lit. He gave me some of the backstory, uh, including the fact that when, when this building was open and that was first illuminated, they hired the Audubon Society to do an eight-week study on bird impact. And Audubon people went out every night for eight weeks, or every day and every night for eight weeks, and they counted dead birds around the building. And, and he was happy to report that their bird impact, their bird footprint was fairly small. So they don't think that this has had a terrible impact on wildlife, at least as far as birds go. Um, they do have a system of dimmers that they have in their possession, but it has not yet been installed. So they're going to have the ability to tune down the brightness. Right now, this is full brightness, and that's what it is every night. But they will have the ability to sort of tune that and come up with a, uh, a good, happy medium in terms of meeting their design goals and also not screwing up the night sky. Uh, so, you know, a great conversation with a uh, facilities management person at CUNA. And another example of people trying to do the right thing. He was not happy, by the way, with those interior lights being left on in the first floor at night. He says, that's unnecessary, that's intrusive, and they're going to do something about it. Uh, look at the rest of the building, five-story, six-story building. It's pretty dark. Uh, people in Madison with new construction, uh, they're doing good things. Uh, the city of Madison is not starting in negative territory for any kind of dark sky initiative the way a lot of cities would. Madison has already done some good things. So just in terms of definitions, talking about light pollution, let's define it. Light pollution has been given by the IDA and by uh, the research community, because there are a lot of people who do research on night sky illumination, the definition that has become operable. This is what they're using. Any adverse effect or impact that is attributable to the use of artificial light at night, that's what light pollution is. That's the operational definition. What is light pollution? Talk about a number of different categories. These are four of the most frequently talked about categories. Light trespass, when your lights go someplace where they're not wanted. And that example of light trespass shows those uh, path lights obviously intruding into the homes uh, of the people who live in those apartments or those condos or those, ho those houses. Uh, the overlighting um, slide, I don't know, but I believe that's Hong Kong. Um, and that just speaks for itself. You don't, you, you don't need to explain anything about what overlighting is with a picture like that. Light clutter, we talked about a little bit. Uh, competing, conflicting design for lighting in the same space. And then uh, glare, uh, in that case, a traffic example. So light pollution has impact in a number of areas. Um, you know, not even mentioning astronomy, but obviously astronomy is one that's, that's close to all of our hearts. Another local example. This is also on Mineral Point Road. This is the affiliated 
uh, podiatry, and I think that's dermatology. Um, there's a flag there. And I didn't know until I started this presentation, and, and one of our members, Kevin Santulis, informed me that um, flag flying comes with a lot of its own rules. Um, Title IV of the United States Code addresses flag regulations. Flags are supposed to be raised at dawn and lowered at sunset. But the writers of the code recognized that not everybody would have personnel to be available every morning and every evening to raise and lower the flag. And there's some, some pomp and circumstance. It has to be done a certain way. So they recognized the fact that there might be some flags that fly 24-7. If a flag flies 24 hours a day, says Title IV, it has to be illuminated. How do you illuminate a flag? I mean, maybe 15 square feet of cloth flying at 70 feet altitude. Well, what you do is you put a floodlight here, you put a floodlight here, and there's another one that you can't see back there, and you have three floodlights shining about a billion lumens you know, up into the sky, some small percentage of which falls on the flag. It's a nicely lit flag, but obviously just wasted light, wasted electricity, and wasted money. Uh, but because Title IV of the U.S. Code says that they have to do it, there are a lot of flags out there. Memorial High School, Ben, um, has a great example of that on the, uh, the west side facing West Town Mall. I don't know what kind of lights those are, but they're like, you know, they're old, you know, magnesium flare. They're, 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 they're gross, but, but that kind of thing happens all around. Not to mention the fact that affiliated dermatology here, they have their own floodlights you know, lighting up the facade of the building. And there's a lot of that that happens too. And again, most of that light is missing the building and going straight up into the sky. So, waste. So, the question here, what causes light pollution? Over a slide like that, you know, we don't even need to answer the question. But the answer to the question, what causes light pollution? And this is, again, the, the consensus answer is we call it artificial light at night. And they do use the initialism ALAN, A-L-A-N. And that is the, the acronym or the initialism that the research community has settled on. So you'll see that in the title of papers. You'll see that in uh, uh, summaries that are written up in Sky and Telescope and, and, and places like that. Artificial light at night is what causes light pollution. There are other kinds of light pollution that we're not discussing today, uh, light pollution that happens indoors. And the primary example of that is the light that comes from our many, many screens uh, particularly blue spectrum and, and what that does to the human, uh, to, the, to the eye, what it does to the circadian rhythms and so forth. We're not going to be talking about that at all. We're talking about artificial light outdoors at night. Another local example. This is Owen Park Conservancy off of Old Sock Road on the west side near uh, Crestwood School. Uh, Owen Park Conservancy is a Madison City Park that has conservancy in its name, for God's sake. And um, obviously, they're trying to create habitat for wild animals and birds and insects and all kinds of things like that. That light is a three-headed LED monster. One of the LED heads is tilted up about 30 degrees because they're trying to illuminate this entire stretch of parking lot with one pole. I don't know what the, you know, again, what the lumens are that that light is putting out, but that's, that's a 0.8 of a second exposure, less than a second exposure. That is a great example of bad design, bad overlighting. It's just, it's just miserable. Um, I'm trying to contact the parks department to get a comment on that light. It wasn't there a few years ago. It was just put in relatively recently. Um, odds are some kind of a uh, safety or security motivation, which is frequently what the, what the motivation is for overlighting. Um, I don't know. I do know somebody in the community that did talk to somebody from the parks, and they asked them the question about this light. And the, whoever the city official was said, well, the park closes at 10 o'clock anyway. Why are you worried? And my response would be, well, if the park closes at 10 o'clock, why are we paying for this light you know, to be on out there? So uh, bad lighting, bad design. What do we know about light pollution? 80% of the world lives under light polluted skies. And I'll, show, I'll share with you where these numbers come from. That would be 80% of the world's people live under light polluted skies. 
the Milky Way is hidden from approximately one third of humanity. About 88% of Europe and about 50% of the US never experience true night. Perpetual twilight is what it's called. Those figures all come from, whoops, all come from Fauci, and I'll share that reference again. I'll share where all this comes from a little bit later on. It's not just a problem in the US, it's a global problem. This is one of those US or, or world at night photos. You can see that the problem is largely a northern hemisphere problem. It's largely a right side of the US problem. Uh, European, uh, the Arabian Peninsula, India, uh, portions of, of Eastern um, Asia, Japan, China, and so forth. Uh, but it's a global issue. It's not just a local issue here in the US or, or here in the Midwest. I think this is one of the last examples that I have. The um, Forest Products Laboratory on University Avenue. I went to take this picture because of those parking lot lights. Here, here, there's one behind the stoplight in here. Um, there, 30 years ago, the, the style was to again get those huge powerful arc lamps, tilt them up and attempt to light the entire parking lot, hundreds of feet from where the lights exist. These are extremely visible if you drive down University Avenue and where you get onto Campus Drive headed toward downtown. Um, when I took this picture, I wasn't as aware as I was that there's also a spotlight down here someplace, the spotlight's hidden, but shining up onto the name of the building. Um, again, Forest Products Lab has been there forever, and this lighting has not been updated, and, and it should be, uh, because this is a, a, another just really bad, bad example of bad lighting design, bad lighting practice. We can do much better than that. And I'm happy to say that a lot of places in Madison are doing better. I didn't bring any pictures, but car dealerships are one of the most notorious offenders. Drive around at night and look at our car dealerships in Madison now versus 20 years ago. And most of the car dealerships have updated their lighting. Most of them have done a pretty good job. They still have too many lights, but all the lights are fully shielded, fully shielded. Um, they could get by with about 25% of the lights that they, the poles that they have, and they could tone down the brightness significantly. Um, I don't know what it is that makes us think we need daylight level lights at night, but, but car dealerships think that. Why is this happening? Easy. We overuse light relative to our legitimate needs. That is in a nutshell. Every circumstance that you can think of, every group of people or interest that there is that needs outdoor lights tends to overuse light relative to what their legitimate needs are. Whoops, it's advancing without my permission there. Um, most of that overuse is just simple waste. Most of that overuse is light shining up into the sky where it's not doing anything that we needed to do except lighting up the bottoms of clouds airplanes and birds. And that wastefulness mostly results from a lack of awareness. We just need to educate people. And, and I hope that's something that, uh, you know, we're, we're embarking on a, a course where we're gonna be doing a lot more of that. Why does it matter? Traffic safety is a big one. Um, traffic safety frequently comes up. Obviously we spend a lot of time, a lot of a lot of mental energy in, in deciding how to do it, and then a lot of money lighting our roadways. Energy security and climate change. It matters a lot because we spend a lot of money on generating electricity. And a lot of that electricity that gets converted into light is wasted electricity. We could do much better. Crime is a big one. I think that in the conversations that I have with people, the most frequent reason that, that people bring up is their own personal feelings of safety and security when it comes to the lights that they use around their homes, um, their habits with respect to those lights, how long they leave them on uh, all night in many cases. Uh, the issue of crime and the relationship of crime to light 
is, is it's a complex question, as most questions are. The deeper you dig into it, the more complex it is. But there are things that we can do, we can do much better than we're doing. And finally, wildlife. Any one of these four areas could be an entire, and has been, you know, there are talks given, documentaries are made, people are expending energy trying to educate the public about the impact on wildlife, about the impact in traffic safety, crime, and energy security, and, and climate change. We need more education. This picture was not taken in Madison. This is a location in the Sierra Nevada mountains in California where I camp. Um, and uh, I just throw this picture up to talk about the International Dark Sky Association. I'm sure that you've heard of the IDA. Most everybody in this room has probably heard of the IDA. Founded in 1988 in Tucson, Arizona, IDA has done more than just about any other group that I can think of, not just in the area of lights and lighting and light pollution, but raising the awareness level of the community, raising the consciousness of people all over the world for the impact of nighttime lighting. If you join one group this year, IDA would be a great choice. Support IDA and what they're doing because they do incredibly good work. Recently, IDA has really refined their messaging. And they've, they've created what they call the five principles of smart lighting. And this is everywhere. So you'll see it on their webpage, probably t-shirts. They make brochures and posters and you can buy them from IDA. At, at cost, you can also just download them and print them yourselves. The five principles are really five quippy, short ways of communicating what we need to do. Use light only if you need it. Direct light so it falls where you need it. Use light only when you need it. Very common sense. Use light only to the brightness needed and minimize the amount of blue light that you use. And they even collapse them down into one word summaries to be especially, especially quippy. Um, these are everywhere and this is a good, uh, a good barometer. If you see a bad light like that Owen Park Conservancy light, use this as your checklist. Uh, are we using light only if needed? Are we directing it so it falls? You know, and, and that light failed basically on every count. IDA says that these are so simple and so common sense that they don't need any additional explanation. But if you want additional explanation, they provide that too. It's on the posters. Uh, this, is, this is an example of one of the brochures. They have this on everything from business card refrigerator magnets up to wall size posters and, and beyond. So IDA is doing a really good job with messaging. So I'm going to change course now. And we're going to talk about international dark sky communities. Because as I said, this is now relevant to Madison. Um, IDA started this program around the end of the 1990s into the beginning of the 2000s, where they designate certain places in the world as certified dark sky locations or destinations. Communities is only one of the categories. They have these additional categories too. Parks, reserves, night, urban night sky places, and sanctuaries. All of those should have the word international on the beginning of them because they're all worldwide designations. I took the word international just to save a few photons tonight. <laughs> We're gonna mainly talk about dark sky communities, but I just wanted to briefly touch on the other four. Parks are just what you think they are. Parks are areas that are set aside, usually protected for conservation, also for recreation. Anything that you think of as a park is an example. Um, the example I used here is Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado is an international dark sky park. I could have chosen an example a lot closer to home. Right here in Wisconsin, Newport State Park up on the Door County Peninsula is an international dark sky park. Uh, it is the only one in Wisconsin thus far, though the Kickapoo Valley Reserve out in the western part of the state is working on that designation right now. So we may have a second one in a couple of years. Reserves are interesting. Uh, dark core zones surrounded by a populated periphery. The example I used is the Greater Big Bend International Dark Sky Reserve that's in uh, mostly in Texas, but it crosses into Mexico too. If you know where Big Bend National Park is, Big Bend International Dark Sky Reserve encompasses all of Big Bend National Park, 
Big Bend Ranch State Park in Texas. If you know the Davis Mountains, where the McDonald Observatory is, it encompasses all of the region around the Davis Mountains. It's a huge area. It extends south across the Rio Grande into Mexico, truly an international dark sky reserve. Uh, this idea of the core zone surrounded by a populated periphery, this is a good example because if you think about Big Bend there in West Texas, you've got Albuquerque and Phoenix off to the west. You've got Salt Lake and Denver to the north. You've got El Paso, Dallas, Houston, Austin, San Antonio to the east. And in the middle there is the Big Bend region, and it's a black hole. It's very, very dark. It's being somewhat encroached upon by the oil development around Midland and Odessa to the north, but Big Bend is still amazingly dark. Not only is it protected by the National Park, State Park activity in the area, it is an international dark sky reserve recognized um, by the IDA and, and by other organizations. Urban night sky places, probably the most interesting one because if we just stick to the, other, the others, we're going to be limited to the western part of the U.S. Urban night sky places give a chance to those communities that are not blessed with the wilderness isolation that the Big Bend area has. Um, sites surrounded by large urban environs, they actively promote authentic nighttime experience. The example that I used is Fry Family Park near Canton, Ohio. I bet Nobody in this room has ever heard of Fry Family Park. So let me show you where it is. That's Cleveland to the north. This is a, a dark sky contour map, the same kind that Ben talked about. This is based upon inferred satellite data, not based upon ground measurements, but this is the kind of model that I use a lot. Many people use a lot. So Cleveland is a big blowout, big urban area, a lot of light pollution. Um, Akron in the middle. Smaller blowout, but still a badly light polluted area. And then Canton down at the bottom, 10 miles south of Canton is where Fry Family Park is. It's about 150 acres uh, of a park that has applied for and been granted um, urban uh, night sky place, international urban night sky place, because they are taking steps to preserve what they've got. They're never going to be Big Bend. They're never going to be um, Newport in Wisconsin, but they're trying to preserve an authentic night sky experience, and they got the recognition from the IDA. There are a lot of these urban night sky places. Some of them may surprise you. Finally, dark sky sanctuaries. These are the most remote places in the world where conservation is most delicate. Uh, the example that I use is Boundary Waters, a canoe wilderness area in northern Minnesota. Uh, huge expanse, a million acres, something like that. Uh, protected by not only its status uh, as a wilderness, but it's an international dark sky sanctuary, so additional protection. So all of these categories exist in the U.S. and they exist worldwide. They're, they're great examples throughout um, the world. But let's go back to dark sky communities because that's what we're going to end on tonight. Here's the IDA's definition. This is a great definition. Every word in this definition is significant. So I'm going to read it to you. An IDA dark sky community is a town, city, municipality, or other legally organized community that has shown exceptional dedication to the preservation of the night sky through the implementation and enforcement of a quality outdoor lighting ordinance, dark sky education, and citizen support of the dark skies. Dark sky communities excel in their efforts to promote responsible lighting and dark sky stewardship and set good examples for surrounding communities. Whatever committee wrote that definition packed a lot into that paragraph. That's a good definition. International dark sky communities are all over the world, but there are 26 in the US. And these are them listed here in descending order by population. So I'll just let you look at that list for a second and notice what you'll notice. <laughs> yeah. I will point out that number one, Flagstaff, the most populous of the dark sky communities, at just under 77,000 people by the 2020 census, Flagstaff is kind of a gimme. 
The Dark Sky Community Program started in the late 90s. IDA formed in 1988. By the time IDA was even formed, Flagstaff was well along the way. Flagstaff has been thinking about dark skies for decades because it's home to the historic Lowell Observatory. There are a number of other observatories in that area. Northern Arizona, you know, just south of the Grand Canyon, that area, above Phoenix and Sedona and, and the light pollution that's down south. Flagstaff was a natural area to, to try to preserve its night sky for the tourism value as well as the value to their astronomers and to their wildlife. Flagstaff has been working on this for years. When Flagstaff filled out the application for Dark Sky Community, they probably stamped approved pretty much right away. Flagstaff has done a great job. Number two on the list, Homer Glen, Illinois. How many of you have heard of Homer Glen, Illinois? All right. Some others. Go down a few more and you've got Hawthorne Woods, Illinois. Have you heard of Hawthorne Woods? So Homer Glen population almost 25,000 and Hawthorne Woods under 10,000. Let's take a look at them. They're both suburbs of Chicago. Um, Homer Glen is the bottom one about 25 miles southwest of downtown Chicago and Hawthorne Woods is about 30 miles from downtown but they're both buried in the Chicago suburbs. Here is the light pollution map signature. So those aren't dark places. You know, by any definition, the red code on this map is bad. You know, it's just, it's bad. Most of Madison would be in the red on, on a light pollution map of Madison. Um, but yet, those two cities applied for and were granted international dark sky community status. Um, Homer Glen is the oldest one. They got their designation, I think, around 2013, 2014. And you see this little peninsula of red extending into the, the blob of white. I wonder if Homer Glen's efforts have contributed to just preventing the encroachment of light pollution in that small area. I don't know. Um, Hawthorne Woods up top. Um, both communities that, if you go to their websites, if you, if you visit the towns, and you look at the sign, welcome to Homer Glen, Homer Glen there'll probably be an IDA seal you know, on the signage because they, they celebrate their steps. They're trying to preserve the experience of the night in the catastrophe that is the Chicago metropolitan area. More power to them. The other thing I'll point out about this list is about two thirds of them are under 5,000 people in population. About three quarters of them are under 10,000 in population. So going back to the definition, the really good definition of a dark sky community with words like exceptional dedication to the preservation of the night sky, um, dark sky education, citizen support, Dark sky communities excel in their efforts to promote responsible lighting. Madison? Population according to the 2020 census, 270,000 people. That's the city limits. If you go out into the metro area, you know, incorporate in the Verona's and Middleton's and Sun Prairies and Stoughton's and on and on. Population estimates, I've seen different numbers, but 400,000 for Dane County. Some people put the metropolitan area of Madison as high as 600,000 people. Flagstaff has 75,000, 77,000. Could Madison be a dark sky community? And if you're skeptical, I am too. And, and I certainly would have been a lot more skeptical six months ago than I am now. Here is the broad view of our region. Put the cities in there. Um, and then overlay the light pollution signature. And you can see that in between Chicago and Milwaukee to the east, Minneapolis to the northwest, Des Moines to the southwest, um, Madison is not great. But there is this area in western Wisconsin that still looks promising. That's where Kickapoo Valley Reserve is. 
That's why they're going for that designation. That's sort of a, you know, the dark sky reserve definition that we talked about earlier. They are, are still, I mean, they still have good dark skies out there. Now, every year it gets a little bit worse because the light blooms of those metropolitan areas get a little bit bigger and a little bit brighter every year. And when that happens, that blue area in the sea of green gets squeezed more and more and more. And, and so that, that, that area is very much at risk. But Madison, let's talk about Madison. This is the metro area of Madison. And this is the light pollution signature overlay. So Madison is a big red blob. And this is data from 2020. And I'll share with you where this data comes from too. The creator of this, of this data set and this website was actually one of our guest speakers about a year and a half ago, a guy named Dave Lorenz. He works for the, he's a scientist for the space science, uh, I'm blanking all of a sudden, the University of Space Science and Engineering. Yeah, there you go. And, uh, and he created this model. So he has data on this website from 2006, I want to, I want to say 2016, and then 2020. Just in 2020, do you see this little blob of white? What downtown Chicago and downtown Milwaukee look like? In 2020's data, for the very first time, Madison had a little bloom of white in the middle. Now again, going back to what Ben said, these are not ground measurements of people holding light meters up to the sky. This is data from satellites taking measurements of a variety of things and, and building a model based upon that data. So it's a data model, it's not ground truth. But it's concerning, zoom in on the isthmus and, and there it is. I don't know why it's there, I don't know why it's kind of that southwestern portion of the isthmus off of Capitol Square. I'm not sure, but that's what, that's what that model says. What's it going to look like five years from now, 10 years from now? It's not going to get any better unless this community makes a significant effort to do something about it. And maybe we're there. So I'll go back to the picture I showed you initially. That picture I took of the comet, it's looking right over that area of the isthmus. That's the area of the isthmus that we're talking about. Again, the capital is just an awful example of wasted light in order to light up the capital. There's probably a Wisconsin state law that it has to be done, and I wouldn't be surprised if that's true, but I bet there are better ways to do it. So let's talk about dark sky communities. And I'm sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a bunch of text now. I'm going to breeze through it. But I just want to give you an appreciation for what this application process looks like. What Homer Glen in Illinois had to go through. What Flagstaff had to go through. What those other 26 communities had to go through. The application process. This is available on the web. Darksky.org is the IDA's website. This is a table of contents. 13 pages. And note that the minimum requirements for all communities runs five pages of that 13. Minimum requirements to be a dark sky community. I just want to expose you to a little bit of that. That's the five pages. Read carefully. I'm going to zoom in and just, just go through. I don't, want to, I don't want to bore you with all of this because it is, it's, it's lengthy. But part of what I want to impress upon you is that this is not easy. This is not easy easy to do. Minimal requirement number one, and then it has all those sub A, sub B, sub B, and C, and so forth. A quality comprehensive lighting policy like the IDA IES model lighting ordinance. IES is the Illuminating Engineering Society that includes all of the following minimum standards for permanent lighting installations, and that AB goes up through H. A, full shielding of all lighting fixtures all over 1,000 initial lamp lumens. Everything is footnoted. I'm not going to show you the footnotes. This is, it's complex, it's comprehensive, it's tough. Um, a limit on the emission of short wavelength light. Um, and it goes on to the next page. Uh, C, D, E. You see uh, C is restrictions on the total amount of unshielded lighting available. You have to account for that a policy to address overlighting, um, regulations on new installations. F is a great one, restrictions on the installation and operation of illuminated signs. Signage is a terrible problem. Um, going on to the next page, we're still on number one. 
G, outdoor recreational and athletic fields, and look at the sub, you know, points one, two, three, and four, uh, strict curfews, timers, et cetera, et cetera. This is, this is, not, this is not a simple process. Uh, requirement number two, there at the bottom, community commitment. The city uh, owned lighting conforming with or committed to conforming with the lighting policy um, for a timeline for completion in no more than five years. So the city doesn't have to do everything right away, but the city has to make a commitment to coming into compliance with these things within five years from the date of the application. Uh, number three, broad support for dark skies from a wide range of community organizations. That's where places like MAS come in. MAS will be one of those organizations. Four, community commitment to dark skies and education as shown by at least one of the following. We can certainly do education. Five, success in light can control as demonstrated by at least one of the following uh, construction projects and alternative evidence of success in light pollution control can also be discussed. Number six is a sky brightness measurement program. That's what Ben was talking about. So we have to have some kind of sky brightness measurement issue. We have to have data. And then the final page um, goes into once established, the community must uh, trumpet the fact that they are a dark sky community. So there has to be signage. Um, there has to be uh, language in the communities, in, in the city of Madison's webpage and brochures and advertising and things like that. This is not easy. This is, this is not easy. <clears throat> this goes back to last year. I think you can maybe see the date filed, uh, file created date, March. Um, I didn't find out about this until last fall, but this is a not a proclamation. This is a resolution that was presented before the Common Council of Madison. Two Madison alders wrote this. Now, I'm not going to challenge you to read that. It is in the form of a resolution, so I'll blow that up a little bit. Resolutions are whereas statements. Whereas, whereas, whereas. Whereas light pollution is defined by the IDA as any adverse impact or effect attributable to the use of artificial light at night. Whereas light pollution can negatively influence blah, blah, blah. Whereas light pollution can disrupt migration patterns of birds, blah, blah, blah. All those whereas statements. You get down to the last one on this page. Whereas the city of Madison is committed to fostering environmental, economic, and social resilience and created the Madison Sustainability Plan. They're, they're blowing their own horn. They've already done some good stuff. Continuing on the next page, the whereas sustainability plan again. Whereas in 2004, the city's exterior lighting ordinance was updated in 2004. Some of the good things that I've seen and that you've seen are thanks to those 2004 and 2008 ordinance updates. Madison has done some good things. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the city of Madison commits to the five principles. And they list the five principles. And then, whoops, wrong button, sorry. Uh, be it further resolved that the city of Madison will apply for designation as an international dark sky community through the International Dark Sky Association. There it is. And then finally, be it resolved, and, and they updated, they, they did some ordinance improvement as part of this resolution. So that was just the resolution written in March. Um, it's only a resolution until it's voted on. And last, this, you really have to dig for this information. Madison is a bureaucracy like any city. Legislative Information Center, a website that I didn't even know about, but this is our resolution, and you can see its path from when it was first presented up through 712. In July, it was voted on by the full Common Council, and it says it adopted unanimously uh, news reports at the time said the vote was 16 to 2. There were two nay votes on the Common Council, and both of those people voted against it because they were worried about the fiscal impact. How much is this going to cost people to retrofit these lights? How much is it going to cost? If they were worried about the fiscal impact, they voted no. But it passed 16 to 2, or if you believe this, it passed unanimously. And remember, Madison will apply for international dark sky community status. Boom. It's, it's a done deal, according to the Common Council. 
So, can Madison be a dark sky community? Let's be optimistic. <laughs> it's it's going to take a long time. As of February, I sat in on a meeting with uh, a couple of alders, including the two alders who wrote that, uh, several city officials, uh, administrators within departments like codes and ordinances, um, uh, building permits, uh, those kinds of things. In February, and, and you know, obviously they're aware of this, I, they looked a little bit shocked to me because they had had a chance to digest those minimal requirements. And they had a chance, and they realized what they're up against. The Common Council said we're going to do it. They are now the ones who are charged with implementing it. I talked to them about what we can do as a community, as NAS and, and other communities, and they said there will be a time and place for that. But right now, the city administrators need to do their job. Those wheels turn slowly, but they do turn. They're working on it. Things will happen. What can we do? Well, things you can do. You can do a number of things right now. Basically, start at home. Change a light bulb. You know, make an improvement in your driveway or on your deck. If you have a neighbor, talk to your neighbor. Talk to your landlord about making a change maybe that you can't make yourself. Use motion detectors, timers, and smart bulbs to limit the negative effects. Join the IDA. Join the MAS. Contact your town or jurisdiction about a bad light that you've seen. All of the examples that I showed you, I've used the City of Madison's website, Contact Us website. I have good results with that. I, I often get answers back. and At least there's a record of somebody having made a complaint. Something else that you can do? Become an activist. Join Madison Dark Skies. What is Madison Dark Skies? Right now, it's just me. <laughs> but I have these two pads, and um, I have a pen. So I'm going to pass these around. What I'm asking for is, is uh, if you are willing, put your, your name and your email address. Um, and before you put it, let me tell you what you're going to get if you do put that. So it's, it's an organization that doesn't really exist except that I am trying to create. Working with partners like Ben Sensen at the Planetarium, uh, Jim Lattice here at Space Place, Kay, who is in the audience. Um, what I would do is I'm not going to send you, I'm not going to write a newsletter, so you're not going to get a newsletter. I'm not going to send you appeals for money because I'm not raising money. What I will send you is when I know something is going on, in the city administration. And I know that they're considering a new ordinance for construction sites or whatever. They're going to hear from the developers. They're going to hear from the big money interests who drive the economy in a city like Madison. They need to hear from you too. So I will tell you when there's an opportunity to maybe speak at a public hearing about dark skies. I will tell you when it's time to submit those web forms and get the word out. Um, I will tell you when it's time to call somebody, and I'll give you the number. Uh, email your alder, register a concern. That's what this email list is for, basically to mobilize the troops because they're going to hear from the lobbyists, they're going to hear from the big money interests who don't want to be concerned with new regulation on lighting. They need to hear from community members like us. Liking a comment on Facebook is not going to do it. Writing a comment on Facebook is not going to do it. And that's our major path to social engagement these days. It's not just going to be a social media thing. We need to make sure that the city hears from us. References, additional information. Most of what I shared with you tonight comes from this amazing publication. IDA just put this out last year. Artificial Light at Night, Alan. The State of the Science, 2022. What does the science say? They um, summarized more than 300 peer-reviewed studies. Um, that's where it's located on their website. But again, just Google it. Go to the ID web website. 
State of the Science is uh, wonderfully, it's 18 pages long, a wonderful compendium uh, distillation of what the science says about artificial light at night and wildlife. Artificial night at light, light at night and crime. You want the facts? It's a, it's a, great, a great resource. Um, that's the Fauci uh, paper that I quoted earlier. Not Fauci, uh, Anthony Fauci. Um, this is the, a different Fauci with an L. Uh, but this guy's done a lot of research. Um, this is a study that's very influential. And um, <clears throat> the David Lorenz dark sky uh, light pollution map uh, looks like that. That's the example that I showed you in Cleveland. Um, David Lorenz was a speaker right here in October of 2021. And David's entire talk is on our YouTube page if you want to dig into his tool. Because until we have that light meters throughout Dane County data from the ground, this is still the best that we have. So, questions? Dan. I'm all for this. I think it's a great idea, but I think messaging is really important here, and you're not going to make any friends if uh, you're talking about dimming the capital and flagpoles. Well, I agree. Um, I say that as someone who spent a good six hours trying to uh, burn the capital in and Photoshop with my Aurora pictures <laughs> just a few weeks ago. Yeah. You're not going to make any friends talking about those two things. You're not going to make any friends talking to your neighbor about their driveway. Your neighbor is, you know, when you talk to somebody about the lights in their driveway, many people respond as though you're coming at a Second Amendment patriot and you're trying to take the gun out of their hands. That's how they respond. This is, this is, it's a fundamental question, how to do this without being scolds. How to do it without being an asshole. Yeah. And I have real trouble with the line where you go from patient teacher and advocate to asshole. I, I have trouble with it. And, and sometimes because people just say the dumbest things sometimes, but you have to back off and you have to remember that those arguments, I'm talking about safety in your driveway, it's not a rational argument. People are talking about how they feel. Yeah. I feel safer with my lights on. And you can't go at somebody who just made an emotional appeal to you with a, a table of facts and figures. It's not going to work. So you have to be able to connect on the neighbor, the level of neighbors. The capital, there are other ways to do it. I, I like having the capital lit up. It's pretty. It's beautiful. I love having the flag lit up. There are other ways to do it. Yeah, especially these days when you hear stories about either more and more people suffering from anxiety these days, and this is one of those coping mechanisms that people might have. Yeah. Next yeah. question. Um, I just want everybody to welcome to the April uh, meeting of the Madison Astronomical Society. It's a great pleasure to see so many people here. Um, so welcome, and we're going to get right into it. There's a lot of announcements to kind of dig into tonight, so I'll get right into it. Um, first of all, I would like to introduce Ben Sensen. He's the astronomer at the Madison Metropolitan School District Planetarium, and he has a, an exciting new uh, idea to share with us. So with no further uh, delay, Ben. All right, well, uh, thank you guys, and nice to meet all of you. I am technically an observing member um, who never shows up. So, it's, it's, you know, take my money, right? Take my money, it's all good. Uh, we do live in Wisconsin, right? Um, I also um, am collaborating with Bell Burnell and uh, teach the introductory astronomy courses at Madison College as well. Um, but the day job is MMSD Planetarium. And so I'll start and finish with, come see us on Monday and Tuesday of next week. Our public show is topical, um, purposely aligned with uh, International Dark Sky Week, um, with the topic being the dying of the light, we hope. <laughs> and uh, we'll get into a lot more detail with that. Uh, the thing I'm here to talk about tonight is a project that I've been putting together called uh, Dane uh, Skies Project. And its uh, intention is to uh, map out sky quality across Dane County. We're used to seeing light pollution maps that look like this. Um, and one of the challenges with light pollution maps like this is most of them are satellite determined. It's the only way to get the entire country and everywhere and have people be able to see, like, oh, if I go out here, is it darker or is it brighter, right? 
Um, one of the problems with satellite-based data is they typically have a challenge in detecting accurately um, blue light in particular. And uh, so we write algorithms and we try to correct for that. And of course, we're smart scientists people, so you can trust that somewhat. But we all know as astronomers that blue is a pretty important color. Um, any light source from below, that's what scatters the most, creates the most sky glow and, and things like that. Um, and of course, blue is the color that's going to you know, shrink those pupils right down and, and steal our sky from us. So basically, what this project is intended to do is get ground truth. Um, and to do it in a way where we can do it with enough uh, fidelity with multiple monitoring stations that you can actually tell what is happening across the county with some sort of a fine tooth. Um, actually telling if an individual policy, an individual project, or something like that is actually making a difference. And so the intention is to produce a data set, probably one of the first in the world, that has enough accuracy and resolution that you can actually see whether or not governmental decisions are actually making the difference that people think they are, rather than just saying we're doing good work, you know, and we pat ourselves on the back. Um, and in particular, and John Rumble's going to be all over this one, so I'm just going to keep on going. But um, one of the intentions is to support the Madison application to um, be considered for dark sky community status uh, with the International Dark Sky Association. So how do you monitor the sky? Uh, there's a lot of low end ways. You go outside, you go, I can't see anything. <laughs> this is a bad sky. Um, you could be a little bit more you know, involved with technology, and there's certainly apps out there. I'm an iPhone person, so um, Loss of the Night and uh, Dark Sky Meter are two apps that basically use your camera to take a photo and then try to figure something about, about whether it's better or worse. Um, and they have validity in a site. Like if you're at your house or your observing site, and every time you go out to the same place with the same phone, with the same everything, and you clean the lens the same, right? you'll get data that has some relative value of it's getting better or it's getting worse. Um, but in general, those apps aren't scientifically calibrated to any significant degree either. There's a lot of question mark on the data they produce. Um, the IDA uh, actually had a grant program that I failed to get. That was actually the true inspiration for going, well, wow, they're not going to stop me. Um, I, I asked for one of these monitors, and they said, oh, no, we don't have funding. And I'm like, come on, how expensive could they be? Uh, these are made by uh, Unihedron, um, and there's two particular styles. There's actually many different styles of this, this meter. Uh, but this is the one that the IDA recognizes as producing scientifically valid data. And the two iterations I'm looking at are an Ethernet connected one. So basically, if I have power and Ethernet connectivity, um, they'll be live continuous at whatever interval I choose to tell it to take um, sky monitoring data from a site. And so you could literally have every 10 minutes, 15, hour, whatever seems to be enough fidelity without producing meaningless data. Um, and so that's one version. The other version is a data logging version for places like which are way out in the middle of nowhere and have no internet connectivity. Uh, you could still add a monitor there. It's just somebody would have to show up with a USB cord, dump the data on a regular basis, upload it, and things like that. And so the intention is to supply both, certainly as it's needed to do that. Um, these range wildly in price depending on which model and what's the electronics inside. Um, the high end of that, the $450 to $500 is, um, if you have to put it in a weatherproof housing, which is pretty across the board, yes. <laughs> this is an outdoor instrument. Uh, do you need a solar panel connection? Do you need the power over ethernet connection? Uh, there's a lot of wild cards in there. So my best estimate is about $450 per install, uh, plus $100 for uh, the actual mounting. Whether that's a pole, I don't think that's gonna cost $100, right? Stick it in the ground. But if you have to go on a building and make some kind of a TV antenna adapter kind of thing to get it up off the ground and secure it, um, there could be some cost there as well. Uh, a one-time cost, and I'm, I'm going to seek a donor for this, uh, but a, a commercial grade, surveying grade uh, uh, GPS. Obviously, for the data to have real validity, you have to know with some precision exactly where the, the things are. Uh, and that could even be a loaner um, when the first stations are installed and we establish a site. It wouldn't even need to be permanently acquired. But I'll, I'll look for a donor for that. And then another uh, sort of wild card on this is um, it's definitely foreseeable that I could get Ethernet access, but I would actually have to bring the computer brains myself. And so all of a sudden you're talking about a mini PC or a stick PC or, or something like that inside the housing as well. So bottom line, I don't know how much it's going to cost. <laughs> but there is a bracket, and so you can kind of do a lump sum and say if some are cheaper and some are more, here's how it's going to work out. Uh, in terms of getting good data, my calibration site intention is my house. So I live down in Verona, and uh, I'm going to put the first meter, which is still not shipped after months of waiting for it. I was hoping to be able to hold one up, fully installed. Uh, install my house, and it's never going to move. So that we have a baseline of data that has a continuity for one site into the future. 
Uh, I call it a calibration site mainly because my intention is I don't know. I haven't found really good data that talks about the variability of these instruments, one compared to the other. And so my intention is to stall about eight of them at a time as a batch, let them run for at least a month, do at least a comparative calibration. So once they go out in the field, we can at least flatten the data for changes in sensitivity and make sure we're seeing a true variation in sky quality uh, from one location to the other. Uh, all the other little indicators are total arbitrary. They haven't been asked yet. <laughs> but they are the places that I think are low hanging fruit like, you know, I think UW and they got an observatory. It's kind of historic and it has an ethernet in that building because I think there's a department that meets in there. I think we could probably put one of these outside and get power over Ethernet out there. Uh, Madison College, I teach there. They ought to at least listen to me. I already know which part of the solar panel not to touch with when I try to plug in. You know, but these are the proposed stations to start out as, as kind of debug or test sites. Uh, long term, uh, Dane County can be broken into township and range. Um, each one of these bigger boxes is a six by six mile box, basically. Uh, and the intention is to have no fewer than two of these meters per box. Five by seven, 35 times two, that's 70 of these devices. That's the highest density of sky quality meters anywhere on the planet by order of magnitude. There just aren't that many installed anywhere. Boggles my mind, considering the price tag just isn't that much. Uh, the intention in the interior boxes, the sort of a three by, by four grid there, um, where the cities are, uh, would be to add two more to each of those boxes, plus a few random ones here and there for replacement purposes. And that's why the total install number I'm going with is about 100 uh, scattered across Dane County. And with that kind of density of data collection, you should actually be able to um, interpolate and get a true map rather than that inferred satellite truth map um, with ground validity or ground truth. Uh, when we produce the data, this was the beautiful thing. Uh, we've reached a maturity point where I don't have to deal with farming out the data, cleaning up the data, and sharing the data, because there's other places to put it. And so I can automate these devices to shove it out to glow at night. Um, I was kind of shocked when I started looking at just how few of these are used on any basis whatsoever, much less continuously, anywhere in the US, much less the world. So there's thousands and thousands of observations, but it's a big planet, I don't know if you know that. Um, and in the US, the density of the, the readings is just negligible and certainly not continuous. Uh, and there's two other networks that will take the data and share it as well. Uh, so in the big schemes, obviously I gotta get this thing funded. Um, I got one out of my pocket, but uh, the rest will have to come from partnerships with communities, municipalities, donors, sponsors, companies, et cetera. Um, I do have to get my first one in and kind of do the proof of concept that it's gonna work and see how long I can go before I gotta you know, go out there and clean off that little window so the data's good. Uh, so work on the maintenance plan over long term. Um, and of course, long term, what I said was I'm going to support this application for dark sky community, establish a baseline, and monitor the evolution of sky quality over time. Um, and that matches, I'm just going to mention them and leave it at that. John's talking about these. Uh, but there's at least four different places in the, uh, the requirements for getting that designation that we uh, uh, match up to nicely, uh, with the last one being literally that's what I'm uh, proposing is to establish the baseline data and the evolution data on sky quality over a long time term long time basis. Uh, on the side, correlated with next week and sort of the big concept of this, um, I also took on for IEDA as an advocate, uh, writing proclamations and trying to get mayoral and county executive approval of proclamations of a dark sky week next week. Um, and all the little graphics you see there are the municipalities that are already in hand. Um, I, I didn't have time to edit it, but Middleton is also on board, and so that one's in the mail. Uh, the only three communities I didn't get were uh, Monona, Stoughton, and Edgerton. Um, and so next year, always got something else to do. But we even got the county executive. And so there is a simultaneous uh, dark sky proclamation for next week um, from uh, you know, six uh, governmental organizations in Dane County. And it blankets the entire county. Um, one thing I, I can certainly share uh, to support this and the public show, I put together a dark sky bingo. And uh, it is a PDF, and uh, your leadership has it, so they can share it with you. Uh, but uh, please distribute it, send it out. My goal is to get as many people as possible trying to check off, you know, and get bingo. I don't know if we're actually clear postage stamp or X or T or what, but you know, get some bingo by going out and trying to help us preserve the darkness of the sky. And so that's out there as well. And like I said, I'm open to questions and answers. Uh, it's very preliminary in the work here, uh, but certainly join us for our public show on Monday and Tuesday as well. Thank you.
a whirlwind, yeah, right? Yeah, th yeah, thank you very much, Ben. I think this is a great idea, and especially, you know, I think Ayana Research Station in Dane County has a, as a astronomical society, we're always, people are always, saying, always asking us, you know, where's a good place, where's a good sky, dark sky site in the area, and we always like to promote Yana Research Station, so I think it's something I'd be very interested in keeping in mind is using uh, Yana Research Station as a monitoring Absolutely, station. and so even if it starts as a data logging version where somebody once a week, once a month, dumps the data, um, you know, once any internet's out there, that's a whole other game, you just There's, the meter. It sounds like this, you know, like you're saying, with uh, going and mining the data, uh, this might be an opportunity for some citizen science. Citizens, I, I'm hoping some of my high schoolers will take this on in earth science classes, environmental science classes, um, but also because it's a community database, you could have a PhD candidate at UW or anywhere in the world uh, going and mining the data as well. This will be the highest density of sky quality meters anywhere on the planet by, like I said, at least an order of magnitude in the initial phase and by two orders of magnitude when it's done. Nobody has more than one or two in one county, much less a state. So states might have five or six, but that's... That's somebody who goes out and monitors it every couple months when they go observe. So, the same, but yeah, well, just quick, some, yeah, yeah, some quick questions. Yeah. Yeah, my, my, my best guess is most, I hope I can find like, you know, if it's a county a garage or something like that, they're gonna have power, they're gonna have ethernet. If I can tap in and just put the weatherproof box outside with power over ethernet, it's gonna be like 450, 500 bucks and whatever it costs to install. You do that times 100, you can pretty much extrapolate to what the cost is going to be. 100 times 500 is 50,000. Yep. Um, obviously, to do this, it's going to be a total wild card pain if it's a, a total volunteer thing. And so I would hope one of the municipalities would uh, take on maybe a position to maintain it. Uh, I don't know what the life cycle of these are going to be. But, but probably it's going to be volunteers to start with, for sure. So no. somewhere between 50, 60,000 in pure equipment. Only if you bring your pea shooter. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, they are, they are governmental proclamations. They have uh, no legal standing whatsoever. Uh, John will talk about Madison's efforts to move forward. Um, and certainly, um, you know, I was just at Fitchburg Common Council getting it approved, so I have my contact there to try to work with them. Um, ordinances, et cetera, are evolving things, um, and the technology is changing faster than the Common Council can pay attention to it. So in the requirements, you'll hear even numbers that we could be more aggressive than the numbers in the requirements, honestly. Technology is changing really fast on LED lighting, especially. Good for you. <laughs> we have internet and power, and we got a place to put one. Which township and range are you? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Good. Let me know. All right. Um, if there are no further questions, I thank you so much, Ben, for sharing this great idea with us. Because I know yeah, there's been a lot of people concerned about dark sky quality in the area for a very long time. So great work, and thank you for spending all this time. All right, um, I, there are, um, we want to get to the presentation right around 7.30. However, I do have a lot of announcements to get through. 